from two passages of scripture, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6, and verses 9 through 11. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. The second chapter of the book of Hebrews, verse 6 and verses 9 through 11, but one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him. Verses 9 through 11, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for everyone. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons and daughters unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren second timothy chapter 3 verse 12 Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you that you have brought us to this point in our faith journey. And you have given us a faith that does not simply look behind or around, but a faith that looks up. My faith looks up to thee, thou Lamb of Calvary, Savior divine, and because our faith looks up, we know that when we start looking up, things start going up. You've encouraged us to lift up our eyes unto the hills. For when we do that, we get some help. And our help comes from the Lord. Holy Spirit, we thank you for being in charge. You are the executive of the kingdom of the Trinity. And because you're in charge, I don't even have to fret. I don't have to worry. Because you have empowered us and anointed us with a kingdom mandate for ministry. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. This is part two in our series of sermons, The Lens of Lent. Christ's perfection through suffering. Will you repeat that after me? The lens of Lent. Christ's perfection through suffering. Thanks be to God for the Holy Spirit that has inspired these words that we have been blessed to read this morning. For there is no scripture without the ministry of the Holy Spirit. For the Word of God teaches us that holy writers wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 
All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Inspiration is to say that God breathes fresh life into us. There's a tremendous challenge amid the issues of life, the horrors of life, wars, rumors of wars, nation against nation, disappointment, broken dreams. We must resist the urge to become stagnant. And when that happens, we find ourselves engaging in monotonous activity. It takes the momentum and power of the Holy Spirit to move us away from the plan that the enemy has to destroy us. For there is not one human life that Satan does not have a plan to destroy. Jesus identified him and said that he is a thief and he only comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. You must be on a high alert kingdom standard to know that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the enemy is committed to stealing from you, killing you, and destroying you. And to so many people, he is successful. To so many, he has caused them to wrestle with mental illness, depression, confusion, desires to destroy themselves through suicidal activity. There are those who are not even living. They are only existing. And anytime you stop living and just exist, that means you have really lost your purpose in life. If you don't have a reason to get up in the morning and to put your best face on and to put your best effort forth to touch somebody's life for good, you're not living. You're only existing. If you don't have anything to smile about, if you're not happy for anybody else, if you can't even encourage somebody, you're not really living. You are existing. To put it more graphically, you are dead while you live. If you need a chemical to pump you up to make you think you're alive, if you need a needle or a bottle, or if you need to buy some spirits because you don't have any spirit within you, you are a dead person, a living corpse who is projecting life but not possessing it. And that's why I thank God for the Holy Spirit. Because he inspires, he breathes fresh air into a stagnant situation. He breathes life. Why don't you just lift your hand and say, Lord, breathe on me. Yes, after having been troubled on every side, after having been attacked, criticized, after having been rejected, hurt, wounded, you need God to breathe on you. That is why the writer in this passage of scripture that we have read from in Hebrews chapter 2 begins in the sixth verse by referring to the testimony of a believer in God. He says in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 6, but one in a certain place testified. It's significant that he says that the one who testified was in a certain place. He 
he's not just referring to the passage of scripture in Psalm 8, which was a song that was lifted up, a messianic psalm that praises God for the Messiah 1,000 years before he's born. But the fact that in order to write that psalm, God had to take this believer into a certain place. God not only blesses people, but he blesses places. And sometimes you have to strive to get to the right place so that you can receive from the Lord's table. Because if you're in a place where you don't have the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, then you cannot experience God's abundance in your life. For being in a certain place does not simply refer to a physical location. Because you can be in a place but not be in it. Uh, you know, there are some people who are in a church building, but they don't have a church mind. Don't have the mind of Christ. They don't have the spirit of Christ. Your body can be here, but if your spirit's not in it, you're not really here. God has to take you to a certain place. You understand, this writer is the same one who is accredited with saying that God took him to a place that was an out-of-body location. And because God transported him to a place where his body was not allowed, he recognized that he's talking about classified information. I wish I could tell you he's saying what really happened, but I'm only allowed to say so much about it because my body couldn't go there but in the spirit God took me to another place and when he took me to this other place in the spirit he was able to show me things in the spirit that he could not show me in the flesh that's why John said I was in the spirit on the Lord's day because if he had not gotten in the spirit on the Lord's day then he would not have been in the right place to receive a visit from Christ himself what place was he before he was in the Isle of Patmos he'd been persecuted he had been ball in all and anytime somebody puts you in all and ball you it is obvious they intend to kill you somehow God made him survive. Why don't you pause to think about that for a moment. Somehow God made you survive. Here we are this morning. We're not that far from the pandemic. In fact, some folk are still in the pandemic because they haven't even come back to church. Uh, they done been to Rite Aid. They done been to Acme. They done been to Saks Fifth Avenue. Neiman Marcus. But they haven't been back to church. What the pandemic still got you messed up. How is it you can go everywhere else you want to go? But you can't come into God's house. You in the wrong place. God has to take you in the spirit to a place where you hunger and thirst after righteousness. That's how you're gonna get filled. You gotta have an appetite. And when you get hungry for God, when you seek God, when you call on Jesus, that's when he begins to answer prayer. Come on, help me give God some praise. You got to be in the right place. John was isolated, exiled on the Isle of Patmos, and they thought, well, we know we got him because he can't even talk to anybody. He can't fellowship with anybody, and they didn't have internet back then, didn't have Wi-Fi, didn't have satellite technology, but God has always been ahead of anything we can invent, and while they thought they had him shut off in exile, half dead, skin falling off him, he got a visitor, and that's why the writer says, what is man or woman anyway that you visit them? Jesus will come see about you. Jesus will renew your strength. Jesus will lay his hands on you. Jesus will bind up your broken heart. 
the preacher was exiled. The one who writes St. John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Revelation. But God took him somewhere else in the spirit. Jesus shows up and he doesn't make eye-to-eye -eye contact first because he had to prepare him for what he was getting ready to see. He first speaks to him and lets him know who he is. I'm Alpha, Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the first and the last. His voice was like the sound of many rushing waters, like the sound of thunder. And when you hear all that and you thought you had a reason to be despondent, sad, lonely, depressed, you thought you had a reason even to be upset with God. All I've been doing is ministering for your kingdom, preaching your word sharing your revelation look at me i'm exiled my body's been tortured here i am all alone but who knows it may be that god meant for him to be there so he could show up with no other competition i don't want you looking at anybody else i don't want you talking to anybody else i don't want anybody else distracting you i want to put you in a place where when i show up you will give me your undivided attention and when you heard the voice of jesus that's where it starts faith cometh by hearing Jesus seems to say, I don't want you to see me first. I want you to tune in to the right wavelength. I want you to have the right frequency. I want your soul to receive a message from heaven. If you can hear God, you can receive God. God's got to get your attention. He's got to get you to listen. He's got to get you to obey. And when you heard God, he said, I believe I'll turn around and see if I can identify the source of that voice voice it was better hearing than seeing because he could hear him but when he saw him he couldn't stand it Jesus had so much glory that he literally fell prostrate before him as a dead man he fell before Jesus you ought to be able to imagine that you can't even look up at the sun in its strength it'll literally drive you blind Jesus is brighter than the shining of the sun Paul admitted that I was on the road to Damascus but a light starts shining on me that was brighter than the son Jesus is the light of the world John falls before him Jesus transports him in the spirit to another place gives him a supernatural assignment God has to place you in a certain place and when he puts you there he has to secure you the Bible says he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty isn't it something that you need to get into a zone with God where your cup runs over you need to get into a place with God where you feel the presence and power of his spirit where rivers are awakened in your innermost being and begin to flow through your life you need to stop living in a strain and start walking in kingdom dominion that's what happens when Jesus shows up and manifests his glory that's when you can testify one in a certain place testified there used to be a time when we had a space in the service for testimony I know we're too streamlined for that now but it's all right to give your testimony and even if there's no room in the service because of what we have identified as Ritalin saints then the fact is you need to give your testimony anyhow if you can't give it in the service give it on the job give it at home if you can't do it in the service do it after the service do it before the service but never lose your testimony make known his deeds among the people tell somebody how good 
God is. Don't just tell folk about your problem. Don't just tell them about your pain. Don't just tell them about your trouble. Tell somebody how good God, come on, help me give God some praise. Tell somebody how wonderful Jesus is. He said one in a certain place testified. And of course, that testimony in Psalm 8 begins with an affirmation, ends with an affirmation, and in the middle of two affirmations poses a question. The affirmation is, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. That's the way he starts out in verse 1. That's the way he wraps it up in verse 9. You know, that's a motto for ministry that we have at Mount Airy. Always begin with affirmation. Never begin with doubt. Never begin with fear. Never begin with worry. Never begin with confusion. Starve your doubts. Feed your faith. Always begin with affirmation. If you can't affirm somebody, that must be because your power source has been disconnected. It takes God to speak to you and through you. It takes God to overrule Satan's plan for your life. It takes the favor of God upon you, the power of God, the anointing of God to slip you through sticky situation like the valley of the shadow of death. But when the power of God overflows you and you begin to flow in the spirits you see you're not like some birds some birds have to flop their wings to fly you're not a, a jay bird you're not a sparrow you're an eagle which means you got to reach a certain place in the jet stream. You got to find where the right winds are blowing. Eagles have been known to sit on a mountain cliff for hours waiting for the right winds. And when the right winds are blowing, all you got to do is spread your wings. Mount up with wings as eagle. That means you've been cleared for takeoff. You've been taxing for a long time. You've been waiting. You've been struggling. But when the control tower says, it's all right. Just spread your wings. You've been cleared for takeoff. I wish I had somebody in here that had some faith. Why don't you touch somebody and tell them, you've been cleared for takeoff. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. Run and not be weary. Walk and not faint. Shake off your doubts. Shake off the distraction. Shake off your fear. Spread your wings. You've been cleared for takeoff. Yes. God knows the right time to sin the right winds. That is why this writer testifies with such a passionate message that a thousand years later, the writer of Hebrews says, I want to remember that testimony. I believe that a testimony is non-transferable information. I really can't give your testimony. And you can't give my testimony. You've been in a court of law before, and even though some people don't even believe in the Bible, but when you get in court, somehow they find an old Bible somewhere, and they want you to put your hand on the Bible. A few days ago, I had to install some elected officers, and they said, well, this is the script for these officers to take the oath of office. And I said to them, well, I'm not going to read that script because it's against my beliefs. Uh, you say you want me to tell them, I swear. Well, the Bible says swear not. So I got another word for you. I affirm. You remember what we say? Always begin with affirm. You ain't got to swear. Affirm. Know who you are. Know what you stand for. Know what you believe. I've got a right to affirm. 
this testimony is an affirmation and every time you testify you affirm that God is at work in my life you affirm that God is leading me you affirm that his Holy Spirit is in me you affirm that you trust him you believe in him it's a strange thing that some folk ain't never testify never even said I'm saved never even said I'm delivered ain't never said I got joy never even said I've been washed in his blood never said I've received the Holy Ghost you might need to join me at the altar in a few minutes if you ain't never testified because the way I came up Deacon Copeland you didn't leave the church until you testified because they knew that if you couldn't testify something was wrong somewhere they knew if you couldn't testify, you must be condemned. You must be convicted. You got to be able to speak for yourself. Can't nobody say I'm saved for you. You got to say that for yourself. I know I've been redeemed. I know I've been chained. Anybody know it? Come on, help me give God some praise. Yes, this writer begins with affirmation after affirming in Psalm 8, 1 and 9 the excellence of God's name. He then brings us in for an appraiser. What is a human being? Why are you interested? Why do you invest so much in them? You don't even love angels. You ain't never saw it in the Bible where God says, I love you, angel. You can't love an angel that when one sins is immediately cast out of your presence. Don't even get a chance to repent. Don't get a chance to say, I'm sorry. God ain't never anointed an angel at all. Never gave him a prayer meeting. Never had an angel revival. Because angels can't get saved because God won't give them the opportunity to repent. But he loves men and women, boys and girls so much. He's long suffering. You fall down he picks you up you're broken he puts you back together you fail he loves you back to strength why do you love us so much you never said to Gabriel I love you never told Michael I love you but then you said to us frail sinful human beings God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you ain't never said nothing in your life, you ought to be strong enough in your faith to tell somebody, God loves you and I love you too. That's how you win souls. You don't win souls by how long your robe is. You don't win souls by how often you sit in a pew. You win souls by that action word called love. You got to literally love the hell out of folk. You got to love drugs out of them. You got to love depression out of them. In the name of Jesus you have authority to love. Come on help me give God some praise this morning. It is from that context that the writer says but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. Why did it take Jesus down? Why is it that the one who was above the angels now is demoted to being lower than the angels? You need to understand this in this Lenten season on this communion Sunday. This is the only communion Sunday in the 40-day season of Lent. Lent doesn't begin on Sundays. Lent begins in the middle of the week. Lent starts on Ash Wednesday, which means in order to have Lent, you got to crash somebody else's party. And I'm glad that Jesus crashes the devil's party. While other folk were saying, we're going to have us a fat Tuesday, also known as Mardi Gras, God steps in and said, no, what you need is Ash Wednesday. You going around here in skimpy outfits talking about you celebrating Fat Tuesday, you need to shed some pounds, lay aside every 
weight and the sin that does so easily beset you. Run this race with patience. Ash Wednesday. That means take on a mode of repentance, of self-denial, of sacrifice, of submission and suffering. And when you humble yourself before God, then God has mercy on you. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. I don't understand why folk go boldly to the crack house, to the bar, but are shy about coming to the altar. You ought to be running to the altar. You ought to be getting to the altar. You don't even have to wait till the sermon is over. If you can go to other places boldly, you ought to get your nerves up, get your confidence up when it comes to the altar. The altar is where God mends your brokenness. The altar is where God heals your spirit. The altar is where God forgives your sin. The altar is where God gives you power. Come on, help me give God some praise today. We see Jesus. I wonder, do you see Jesus this morning? You got to have enough faith to see Jesus. Because you really can't see him and appreciate him in the flesh. John couldn't even do that. That's why he fell prostrate before him. Paul couldn't even do that. That's why he said, I had to leave my body behind. And God had to take me up in the spirit into the third heaven. There must be a trinity. God would not show Paul these things in the first heaven. And would not show him these things in the second heaven. In the first heaven, birds and planes can fly. In the second Adam, uh, heaven, spaceships and satellites can orbit the earth. But in the third heaven, you can't get an American Airlines plane into the third heaven. You can't get a lunar module, can't get a satellite into the third heaven. That means this is beyond the place of human domain. You got to go to a place where flesh cannot flourish. God's got to get you out of the flesh. And I know you love the flesh. Flesh is a billion dollar cosmetic industry. We rub the flesh. We make up the flesh. Try to take wrinkles out of the flesh. Cut the flesh. Reshape the flesh in order to impress people. We spend money we don't even have. Buying things we don't even need. To impress people we don't even like. You need to go into a place where flesh has no rule. That's why Paul said, I had to go to the third heaven. That means I had to have some booster rockets. Why don't you ask somebody, you got any booster rockets? Even a space shuttle had to have booster rockets. Some places you can't get to on your own power. The fact is, you can't even go up to God. But God can come down to you. Jesus came down. Jesus laid down his royal robe. Jesus gave up his position. I'm equal with God. I'm filled with glory. I'm above the angels, but I'm coming down, down to be born of a virgin, down so men can spit on me, nail my hands, nail my feet. I'm coming down so they can spear me in my side. Oh, down. Thank you, Lord, for coming down. I could not go up to God, but God came down to me and gave 
me some booster rockets. I thank God for booster rockets. Goodness is one booster rocket. Mercy is another booster rocket. Oh, oh, surely goodness and mercy shall boost my orbit. Goodness and mercy shall follow me. Oh, goodness and mercy will lift me higher. Goodness and mercy will chase after me till I reach another address, till I reach another city, till I live in another place. I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place that where I am you may be also and I know you can't get there I know you can't drive your car there I know you can't buy a plane ticket there but I'm gonna come get you you can't come up to me but I will come down to you oh, oh yes oh Lord I know February is gone and I miss you February but I'm still black it's March but brother Tim I'm still black and so let me bring my testimony from February into March the old slave said swing low sweet chariot stop and let me ride I can't make it to heaven I can't get to God I can't reach the clouds but swing low oh Oh, swing low, Jesus will swing low, Jesus will lift your burdens, Jesus will renew your strength, Jesus will give you power, swing low. Oh, swing low, I'm glad Jesus said, low. I'm with you. I believe I better say that again. Lo, I'm with you. Sometimes your money gets low. Sometimes your friends get low. Sometimes your strength gets low. Oh, sometimes your courage gets low. But Jesus said, I'll swing low. I'll pick you up, I'll turn you around, I'll set you in a certain place, a place of mercy, a place of power, a place of strength. Say yes, say yes. Come on, help me give God some praise today. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me on. Swing low, oh, sweet chariot, coming for to carry. Hit me sing it one more time. Swing low. Oh, sweet chariot. Coming for carry me home. Oh, sweet low. Oh, sweet chariot. Sometimes you have to use 
use the lens of faith. I looked over yonder, and what did I see? Coming from to carry me home. Oh, great band of angels coming for me. What they coming for? Coming for to carry me The same God that kept my great great grandmother swing low. Let us give God thanks. Eternal God, our Father, we bless you for this opportunity to reach souls around the world. May you continue to bind us closer together in the love of Jesus Christ. As your word says, now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. May the power of the Holy Spirit move upon our lives that we may fulfill our kingdom assignment. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.